You know, but it's also a, a fact of, are you nudging from the Republican majority, the control of that, which is what the voters wanted, and behind the scenes, behind the locked doors, in the dark corners, moving that control back to the Democrats. Is that the quid pro quo Absolutely. behind the whole process of electing Sean Jasper by the Democrats? Max. And, and, and on that point, some of these things that are happening, happening that are coming out of the Speaker's office, and now the Rules Committee, appointed by the Speaker also, are, are things that even Terry Norelli, a very liberal Democrat who's famous for being heavy-handed and appointing heavy-handed chairs, uh, would never have done. And the, the things that are coming out of that Speaker's office right now, they have shown a pattern of the things that Democratic leadership has been trying to get for years. And every single time there's a dispute on some issue, they are taking the side of the Democrats. We Democratic need leadership. a list, a specific list, because if this is being done behind the scenes, and we know the liberal media here in New Hampshire isn't going to report on this sausage making, we need somebody like you or somebody else that you know to bring that to us, and we'll get it out to the conservative side of the wing, because frankly, there's nothing they can do to us. Basically, we are the watchdogs. We we are the guys with the big flashlights, and this is the kind of stuff that no. I'm, I'm going to plug our own horn here for a second. No, not the not that other horn we've been talking about earlier. Um, toot toot. We yes. Toot our own horn. That one is plugging. I will tell you, <laughs> over the last few months, I have been getting more and more emails and calls from people thanking us for what we blog about at Granite Rock. Because nobody else is. We can't, the comments come in, the emails come in, the calls come into the house. I'm finding myself more on the phone than I am at the keyboard nowadays. There's a message to liberal media. There's a need for this. We are, st we are just volunteers who do this after our regular day jobs. And if we're getting this, imagine what you guys who get paid for doing this could be doing instead of what you're doing. To expose what's going on. And you're not doing it. And I really just, I'm beside myself to say, why is it that a bunch of techies with a little old blog site are reporting on stuff or going after stories that you guys should be doing all the time? And I want to say thanks to you, Brian, and to you, Max, for bringing this stuff to us so we can get it out to our readers, listeners, and watchers. Because nobody else is doing this. If I can, on the previous point... Uh Bill O'Brien, the elected House Majority Leader, sent out an email to all of the reps and to everyone on the list saying, you know, if the Speaker were removing a Democratic member of any committee for any reason, they would bring in the elected Democratic Majority Leader to have a discussion, have a powwow, and that Democratic Minority Leader would be expected to take the side of the of Rep. the Democratic representative. So how can a Speaker of the House who's been picked by Democratic leadership now take the position that he can just pull someone off without speaking to our elected House Majority Leader? Indeed. That's a problem. The second problem that I have with this is people have been talking about criminal justice reform in the last few years more and more. Um, I have two constituents, Sean Kelly and Sean Bedard, from my district, who are serving time in jail right now. I've just spoken with the the uh, the, the family of Sean Kelly, and the prosecutor, also working under Patricia Conway, um, who's now the Rockingham County attorney. She ran as a Republican, despite the fact that I don't know that she's ever registered as a Republican in her whole life, except right before. She hardly ever votes. She she registered right before the uh, the election. That's a whole other story. She's prosecuted a lot of conservative Republicans who are elected officials, including a couple of other state representatives and selectmen and budget committee members. Um, but in the Sean Kelly case, um, there's a there's a full length video from the police officer's dash cam that shows Sean Kelly looking up after this car accident, and he's clearly awake. That's not the video that was shown. 
prosecutor cut that video, and the jury wasn't allowed to see the moment when Sean Kelly looks up and is clearly not only awake but alert. So what the jury saw was this kind of very short, edited little snippet that makes it look like he's asleep at the wheel. And it's it's completely dishonest. It, it's Or the Sean Bedard case, which was just as bad. Patricia Conway was the prosecutor in that case also. And uh, she lied through that entire case also. She brought forward a witness who who testifies all the time in court against men she doesn't like. And Sean Bedard's now serving 7 to 15 years in prison for a crime that he almost certainly didn't commit. And there was, there was as far as, I, I watched most of that trial in person. I, I, I don't think I saw any evidence to corroborate anything that this woman was saying. And what the jury was not allowed to know is, because this woman hasn't been charged with perjury by the county attorney's office, she's able, this witness, this false accuser, is able to testify over and over and over again. And juries are not allowed to know about the about about actions like that. There's a, there's another similar case where a father, not in, in my district, a father has been convicted based on the false accusations of his daughter, and his daughter has come forward and admitted that she lied on the stand, but because she can't be prosecuted for perjury, because she can't get convicted for perjury, um, it, the the father can't get a new trial, even though the one accuser has finally come forward and admitted that she did lie about it. This man's in prison right now. So by so, your not being able to be on the committee to help kind of right these wrongs, you're, uh, I mean, it, it hamstrung, hamstrings all of us. But it also means that the status quo, which obviously is more amenable to the Democrats than it is to the Republicans, with these kinds of techniques, I mean, he, he's padding padding the committee in in, in certain ways, uh, Jasper. It certainly looks that way. And we're seeing this over and over and over again with all the committees. Yes. Correct. Yikes. So the the now, question is, have, is who we, else is so, so basically the Democrats own his ass and they're in danger of owning the house. The house. Well, well, we, well we, we have to give we have to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. We don't. <laughs> we should give everyone the benefit of the doubt. No, <laughs> this is not a court of a law of law. This is a court of opinion. But, yes, uh, yours is welcome too. <laughs> yes, he actually been. has to sit in the house. So let him finish. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there has been a there has definitely been a pattern from the speaker's office from day one. Now the Democrats get to elect their majority leader and who or their minority leader and whoever they've elected. I believe it's shirtless. Oh, shirtless deputy dog. They get to elect theirs. He represents their members. Not a single Democrat, as far as I know, in the out of 160 Democrats, not one single Democrat has been pulled from their committee. It's only senior Republicans. Now, there's been this pattern that more and more people are noticing and more and more people are asking about. And now because uh, Jasper's office has pulled me out of criminal justice and public safety committee, this is becoming a, a, a story that the Concord Monitor has heard about, WMUR has heard about now. Um, I don't know if you saw the the interview that I had, but that was a that was about a ten minute long interview, and they had to cut out, you know, the Chad Evans case. Chad Evans is serving life in prison for a for a murder he couldn't possibly have committed because he wasn't even present when the when Cassidy Bortner sustained the injuries that led to her death, and so now we have a House resolution to to, to put forward that I wanted to discuss on criminal justice. Um, asking the Department of Justice to look into the details of that case. Certainly sounds like a big PR oopsies in the making. Because, you know, th this is only going to come back on Jasper big time. Because he's going to, he's basically showing us what his rep has been all, his reputation has been all the time. And now that we see, I, I'm glad to see that you've been interviewed by the media. Kudos to them for doing this bringing their spotlights to it because now hopefully their itch has been scratched and they're going, oh, more stories. And, you know, he's going to be in an untenable situation, even though, I mean, he's going to take it from the right and the Republicans for being the Democrat appointed speaker. But now the liberals are going to look at him. Oh, he's still a Republican. Let's go get him. And so he's going to he, he's got two barrels of a shotgun looking at him. Now. Other state reps have heard two prominent Democrats. This is why I say Democratic leadership. It's not the average rank and file Harper's reading Democratic representative, you know, including people who have been drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, it's Democratic leadership. I've I've already had a number of 
uh, Republican state representatives say that they've been they've heard prominent Democrat leaders telling Jasper that that they'd bet that he'd better remember who he who works for. Steve, well, you're sitting there going. Is anybody surprised by any of this? No. Anybody? Uh, who's willing to wear a look see into the uh, into the house? <laughs> what is a look see? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can just Google it. I mean, really. Uh, well, no, they're not selling it on the uh, market. They've changed their focus. Yeah, but you can still Google it and find out what it is. I've got one. So, uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. You, you just signed should. up for Project Veritas, Grok Talk. You know, one of the uh, – <laughs> quite often, quite often on Grok Talk, the week's worth of work, whatever it might be, the blogs and all that stuff, is kind of what drives the conversation on the program. Now, in this particular show, which is our first show of 2015, it seems to me that the conversation is going to be driving a lot of blog posts. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> yes. So this is a good thing. Um, you know, One of the biggest problems is even though you have a constitutional right to get all of the evidence in, in, a, in a criminal case, the New Hampshire Supreme Court has said, no, if the trial judge wants to keep it out, they can keep it out. The 200 pages of criminal records on the on the criminals in my home, the 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 woman chasing my housemate with a hatchet, yelling that she's going to kill him for calling the police, the machete, you know, some of the bloody towels. That evidence was kept out, and if witnesses don't show up in your favor, they just don't show up. Um, in the Chad Evans case, uh, uh, again, the jury was not allowed to hear that the babysitter, who had had was not only a major dope fiend. The babysitter, who's the only person who's with Cassidy Bortner at the time that she sustains the injuries that presumably led to her death. Two days before her death, she's dropped out of a pickup truck on her head onto the pavement. Two days before, she, not, a, not a small one, drops two feet straight down onto the pavement and sustained you know, severe injuries. And that may have been a contributing factor in her death. The jury was never allowed to know about that. The jury wasn't allowed to know that... Uh, the, the babysitter, Jerry Marshall, was also close friends with one of the investigating police officers. So you have, you have all of these, these open questions in the Chad Evans case that need to be brought in. You have all of this evidence that is, that is kept out of criminal trials. You know, the Sean Bedard case, the Sean Kelly case, the uh, Robert Breest case. He's finally being given a hearing by the New Hampshire Supreme Court. He's served 40 years in prison for a crime that he, he's maintained 40? his innocence. Yes. Since 1972, he's been in prison. He's now over 70 years old, and he's, you know, he's he's getting on in years. And finally, there's there's DNA evidence. They're finally going to allow him to have a hearing. They haven't even allowed him to have a trial. He has to go to the hearing and have the court look at the evidence to determine whether or not it's good enough to um, give him a new trial. He's been in prison for 40 years for a triple homicide, and and. The, his one accuser has died and had serious credibility issues, and all of this is all kept out. It's all kept from the jury. The jury's not allowed to hear all of the facts. Let me ask you this. In that particular case, has the prosecutor died? Um, from 1972? Yeah. He may have. Well, I'm, I'm only asking that question not out of malice towards the prosecutor, but uh, as a possible reason why they might now consider it. In other words, there seems to be a... Uh, a general trend here or tendency to protect the prosecutors at all costs. And, and therefore, one reason why this person could be getting a hearing after 40 years might be that the prosecutor is no longer around to be shamed. And this is one of the biggest problems. Innocence Project and some of the other groups that work very hard on these wrongful conviction cases, after one of the biggest expenses isn't interviewing or DNA testing. It's after they've proven someone innocent. Their biggest single expense and what really drains their treasury is fighting with these prosecutors, sometimes for another 10 or 12 years after they've proven someone innocent. There's a man in Virginia for rape. 12 years ago, he was proven innocent by DNA testing. He's been fighting for 12 years, and every time they have to hire attorneys and experts and perform more testing and do more hearings and... and and file more motions, it costs more money and it drains them. And these prosecutors are continuously fighting these families um, and fighting um, Innocence Project and other group to drain their resources in the same way that they throw bogus criminal charges out at people. It's it to drain the public defender's sounds, office. It sounds like it's time for modern Robin Hoods to go storming the castle keeps. Oh, yeah. there he is. There's Mike. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, and you really look a at it. Oil and, oil required. And, and we <laughs> and and we keep seeing as political bloggers time after time. You look at Wisconsin and the John Doe um, investigations against conservatives by ideologically progressive liberals who are just trying to basically silence and intimidate types of folks. Sorry. And you do see it's the force of government being used against its citizens for absolutely intimidational purposes. And it's not always just conservative Republicans. Sometimes it's independents, libertarians, constitutionalists, right. people I've who are not even part of a party. And some people who don't even vote, they're just speaking out. Yeah. And now they're being, they've known nothing about politics, and now they're getting targeted by prosecutors, even code enforcement officers, tax collectors. Yeah. And, and you know, the biggest thing was has been the IRS targeting of the Tea Party or constitutional groups. And we've been watching this for over a year. And has anybody been punished? No. All we get is brand new Commissioner Koskinen acting in very snippy ways. How dare you ask me these questions and impugn the reputations of our wonderful public servants, even though when you read the emails, their own emails by their own fingertips, you go, how come they're not in court? I mean, what is with this? And you keep wondering, how much longer are we going to put up with qualified immunity for these people who do, who use government for their own purposes? It's basically shattered the progressive myth of these are nonpartisan technocrat experts who have only your best interest at heart running the bureaucracy. I am more scared of the administrative state than anything else, period. Because you see these guys saying, well, this is what our job is. No, that's not what the authorizing legislation told you to do. Oh, but that's okay. It's only our intent. We are getting, as we said earlier, who's obeying the law, who's disregarding the law, who is saying that the rule of law, one of the pillars of our republic, is basically being shattered at its roots. I, I, I listen to what you're saying on the criminal justice stuff. Yeah, the stuff in the House, it's politics. We know about that stuff. We just need to put the flashlight on it so other people know. But this other stuff on the criminal justice side, where people do abuse the ability to fight for truth. You know, we're, we all say, to, you know, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and yet it seems to be nothing but a facade. It's, it's turned into, like politics, it's no longer just a win to be able to get something done. It's just about the winning part. And now in the court system, with what you've been saying, it's not about the win. It's about the punishment part. I'm going to uh, actually throw this out to you. We're doing like 10-minute segments, not every single week, but like we do a legislative update every week. We do uh, Second Amendment once a month. We do Right to Life once a month. We'll probably do voter fraud once a month. Would you like to do a criminal justice segment 10 minutes on the phone once a month with us? I would love to. All right. We'll set that up after the show. A lot of things we didn't get to today. We wanted to do some stuff that uh, this is just far better than what I had planned, so that's the way Grok Talk works. Um, we're not going to do the top 20 2014. You can go to granitegrok.com and look that up. We're not going to have a time for a uh, year in review kind of a thing, although I, I started a list of stories that were interesting to me. Billy Bear, of course, uh, Jasper's election. Gas prices, huge story this year. You know, They've come down a lot because of things that, yeah. that Democrats didn't want. And where's Gene Jaheen complaining about the spe- Speculators driving the cost of I gas know, down. I know. Jonathan Gruber, of course, Medicaid expansion in New Hampshire, the 2014 elections. Um, we should probably try to get our whiskey tango foxtrot squeezed in. I think we've gotten about 15 or 20 new entrants just over the course of the show, <laughs> um, as is the case we have discussed. Yeah, and, and, the, and the gas price thing is, is a double-edged sword, by the way. Actually, it's, it's got three edges that I found so far. Yeah. Um, First of all, the, the, the lowering of the oil price that drives the gas price is as much done by the Saudis as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Firstly, because they're no friends of Russia or Iran, so it doesn't, help, it doesn't hurt them if Iran and Russia get hurt. But secondly, it doesn't hurt them if fracking companies go out of business, and the Democrats will be very happy about it too. And there's a serious danger that it will become uneconomical to do fracking just as the Saudis, I think, helped to drive some of the original Texas wells out of business yep. back in the 70s before they yanked the price up on us. So watch that one very carefully. But in the meantime, 
we've already got Democrats calling for an increase in the gas tax because, oh my gosh, the revenue decline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you guys can afford it because look how low gas prices well, this are. Is just You'll like, never feel no, this it. This is just like, this is like tobacco. See, they wanted, they want gas taxes, but they want everybody to drive electric cars, which means there's no gas taxes. They want nobody to smoke, but they keep raising the tobacco tax. It's the same thing. All these taxes, the income tax, the sales tax, all their taxes are based on things happening that they are opposed to. They don't like economic development. They don't like commerce. They don't like the free market, yet they want to get taxes. And they don't like profit, and they don't like people earning wages. And they don't wages. like tobacco, but they tax it more. They don't like gasoline, but they tax it more. When are people going to realize that Democrats are complete idiots? Just idiots. So if you go to a vocational school or a trade school or you get into you know, you get into a trade union or you get into a, a professional trade or professional association or you, you become a professor or a doctor and you start making some decent money and you start hitting those really high tax brackets, then all of a sudden you're the bad guy because you're complaining about your taxes. You know, you, you've done all this work. You've, pushed, you've, pushed your, you've driven your way through school. You've driven yourself you're through selfish. vocational school. Making that money. Cold-hearted. And if you if you if you you question the lawyers taking forty five percent contingency fees on injury cases, then you must not care about the injured worker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, that, that's, that's very true. well, very well and done. And then, of course, the Affordable Care Act is neither affordable nor will it provide care. It will be more expensive, and you'll get less of it. You get taxed if you offer a Cadillac plan. You get fined if you offer medical in, if you don't offer medical insurance, and the fine if you do offer medical insurance, but it doesn't meet the federal guidelines for affordable, is higher than if you don't provide medical insurance at all. So what are these companies going to do? If the well, workers, they're pushing them onto Medicaid in New Hampshire, r- right? And <laughs> Thank you, New Hampshire State Republicans. And they are turning Senate Republicans. And they are turning Medicare for older folks into something more like Medicaid. They're going to be pulling 20 to $30 billion a year out of Medicaid, yep. reducing the payments to doctors and hospitals so that a lot of older folks are going to lose choice, and eventually the Medicare program is going to be evolved into something like Medicaid. It, 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 yeah. In fact, help me out here. There's, a, there's something particular I've seen in the news lately. The doc fix, which comes up every year, which is basically, <laughs> which is basically where the Democrats – through typical wishful unicorn thinking, said we can reduce the cost of Medicaid year by year by simply reducing the amount we pay doctors. And that amount has grown to the point where it's about 43 cents on the dollar, and every year the crisis arrives, and every year they vote to not reduce the payments, which is called the doc fix. But now I read that a very similar amount, 43 cents on the dollar, was an incentive for doctors, more doctors to take Medicaid to, as Obamacare phased in, except it's going away. So I'm asking, is that the same 43 cents as the doc fix, or is it, in fact, it's another amount? It's a different amount. It was a two-year juicing of the rates that they were paying. Always supposed to be temporary, but it was more of that crack money. Here, take this. You'll like it. And now all of those patients, they're going to get dropped. And the, the new are patients, say, we can't afford to serve you. Yeah, I mean... The Democrats have always been careful to say, we will give you health care insurance. We will give you coverage. It's not the same thing as actually getting care. And I know several people who are on Obamacare that they can't find a doctor. They won't won't be taken because the rates are even lower under some of those plans than not. So now... And any town, any, any, sorry, any company with over 100 employees, but also any town or any school or school district. Yep. Well... The town of Seabrook has more than 100 full-time employees. The school district has something like 150 full-time employees. So that means that towns, counties, school districts are going to be hit. It means that states are going to be hit with a Cadillac tax or some other uh, one of the other fines. Merrimack's looking at half a million, uh, $500,000 at least. A bold bold legislation. Or is it 500 million? It's a lot. It's a huge sum just for public employees. Uh, rationing just, anyone? Rationing yeah. the, that <coughs> word? Rationing? Just for yeah. the just yeah. for the fine, and they're moving. They're moving. They're changing the private insurance plans as much as they can to make them conform to look like Medicaid. So you still have forty-seven million people uninsured, as we've yep. had for the last twenty years. However, instead of getting quality private insurance or at least Medicare, now everyone everyone older folks are being pushed into a Medicaid-like program. Medicaid patients are being pushed into a worse program. Companies are being are having to push their employees into cheaper Medicaid-like private insurance 
programs. So it's almost like universal Medicaid for everyone, the one program that no one wants. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's no, all and no doctor single wants to pair. Take. It's a backdoor to single pair. All right, that's it for this week's show. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening on iTunes, iHeart, etc., etc., etc. I was totally unprepared because of my computer issue last night. And next week, hopefully, we'll do better. Uh, Jason Sorens will be with us next week, and cool. um, we'll be back next week. Bye. Yeah, baby. When asked whether she still supports Obamacare, Senator Jean Shaheen said, Yes, I do continue to support the law. We're beginning to see some positive results. How can Senator Shaheen say we're seeing positive results when 22,000 of our neighbors have already lost their health insurance? What's worse, the Boston Globe reports the state's only health insurance provider radically reduced the number of hospitals in their network, forcing some people to drive over an hour for lab work, even when there's a hospital within a few miles of their home. When pressed about lack of access, Shaheen said... There are some hospitals that are not covered, unfortunately, and um, I, I certainly hope that's going to change. Jean Shaheen promised us we could keep our doctors and our health care coverage. Now she hopes we can get to a local hospital? Call Senator Shaheen at 603-647-7500. Tell her we need more than hope. We need leadership. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Senator Jean Shaheen said, if you like your current health plan, you can keep it. That's not true, Senator. 22,000 New Hampshire citizens have been kicked off their insurance plans. Hospitals in Rochester, Concord, and Portsmouth, they aren't allowed to provide care under the exchange. Senator, you were wrong in your comments. You should apologize for your misleading remarks. I'm calling Senator Shaheen at 750-3004 and telling her I want my doctor back. You should, too. Paid for by SaberPack.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. All of the music on this program comes to us through Creative Commons licensing from Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers, not necessarily those of CNHT, GraniteRock.com, or anyone else for that matter. Rock Talk.